Hello everyone and welcome to CCNA Connecting Networks version 6 chapter 1 WAN Concepts. So today we're looking at WANs in all its forms looking into connecting our larger networks. So we're looking at the purpose of WANs. I mean, we've got our local area networks, we've got our remote sites, we've got our central office and we need a wide area network in order to connect those networks all to each other. So, most common types of WANs we have, we've got a classic point-to-point, -point. we've got a hub and spoke like frame relay, we've got a full mesh, and we've got dual homed, remembering that the full mesh being the most ideal, but also the most expensive. So typically we're either going to go with a hub and spoke, either using a product like frame relay, or some sort of VPN solution. But if, you want, if you've got a little bit of money and you want dual homed is often a good solution. Small office, home office, larger networks. These are all lands that exist and we need to connect those sites. We can use the public internet, we can use a dedicated service, we can use VPNs from site to site, but this is what we're looking towards. We're looking at the wide area network and everything about it and how we're connecting our little lands that we've built together across large geographical locations. So let's look at the actual operations of a WAN. You've got WAN standards and the WAN standards always operate at layer 1 and layer 2 of the OSI model. There is no layer 3 WAN standard. You've got your customer premises equipment, your data communications equipment, typically on the ISP side, your data terminal equipment, which is the, your stuff. The demarcation, that's where the ISP's responsibilities end and your responsibilities begin. The local loop, the link between you and your ISP or the ISP central office. And in this example, we've got the toll network as well, which is what we're actually paying for. Typically the demarcation is a point You've got a run room in your building where all the services from your, the street come in and that's where the ISPs bring in all their leading cables and then from that point on everything's under your control. Different types of communication implementations. Dial-up modems, definitely legacy. No one uses dial-up modems anymore over the public switch telephone network. We've got access servers which is a dial-in solution, a dial-up solution model also legacy broadband highly used here in australia for we've got dsl and cable internet services csu dsu is just a pretty funky jargon just to represent a digital modem wan switch like a frame relay switch and of course routers and multi-layer routers two broad categories of WAN operations, a circuit switch network or a packet switch network. The easiest example of a circuit switch network would be like a telephone or ISDN. So where you've got a connection from your phone and when you ring up someone else it makes a hard connection through the exchange. So if any single point of failure in that network fails, the phone call will drop. Whereas in a packet switch network, Every packet moves through the ISP's infrastructure based on its own merits. So if there's any sort of outage or queuing or rerouting, everything's fine and the end users probably don't even know what's happening. But the, each packet is switched through the network on its own merits. All right, let's have a look at what type of technologies we should look at. So this is one of my favorite little graphs or diagrams looking at all the different WAN standards, your public and your private. So we're on the public side, we've got the public internet, we've got broadband, cable, DSL, etc., and wireless standards. On the private side, we've got our dedicated or leased lines. Not very common in Australia because they're very expensive, but in Europe and America, they were very popular at one time. And then you got our switched, circuit switched or packet switched. PSDN is pretty much dead, but ISDN is still out there for rural areas who need it. 
and packet switch networks like Metro Ethernet or MPLS, Frame Relay or ATM. Different types of services, just a bit of an example, satellite links, wireless links, telephone lines, cable modems, lease lines, just different types of technologies that can be put together to make up your WAN services. Like I said, lease lines, not very common in Australia, but there was a time in America and Europe where they were very common because they were the, because this before broadband came along. So the T1 and the E1 standards, very, very fast. Notice that the, the modem is just a CSU DSU. So it's just basically CSU DSU is just a digital type of modem, converting those high speed serial connections into an ethernet connection to end up into your routers. So they're very fast, very available, but very expensive. And it's a fixed, it's a fixed connection. So not very flexible at all. You move offices, you gotta pay a whole setup fee in the new location. ISDN, very popular at a time. Two basic flavors, the basic rate interface and the primary rate interface. The basic rate was very often used for houses. You just got that two 64K channels, you bond them together into 128K and that's symmetric as well. So it's 128K symmetric and at that time it's quite fast. And it's got the D channel for the decision making. I liked it, this way I remember it is the B channels are for the bytes and the D channels is for the decisions. And the primary rate interface, depending if you're in America or Europe, if you're in the Americas, it's got 23 channels for data or bytes. And in the European standard is 30 channels. And then there's a D channel for the decision making process. So if you do 30 times 64 plus another 64, that's where you get 2048 for E1 and 23 plus another 64, we get one and a half meg. Now here in Australia, we use, there's a lot of ISDN PRIs people use for telephony. So if you're a business and you get a telephone line and you say you want 12 lines coming into your business, you get an ISDN P, an E1 connection and they you just pay for the amount of channels that you want to use. Frame Relay is a wonderful protocol I'd love to spend a lot of time talking about it, but we just have this very basic introduction into it. In version 5 of CCNA, there was a whole chapter on frame relay, but now it's n far less popular because of the cost. So broadband and metro ethernet is far more cost effective. So frame relay is sort of being phased out, but it uses a permanent virtual circuit. So inside the cloud or the ISP, they could be do all sorts of magic and we don't really care. All the redundancy is taken care of by the ISP and between router one and router two, we just have, as far as we're concerned, a permanent virtual connection. So any problems inside the ISP, the traffic's all routed inside, we don't care. We've got our own private little channel between router one and router two. ATM still in use because of its speed and its fantastic quality of service because believe it or not little ATM cells are only 53 bytes they're absolutely minute but that means when you want to send megs and megs of data from all different sources with all different quality of services you can very easily chop that data into tiny little pieces so you can really interleave the fast data so the, the important data with the less important data and get a fantastic quality of service out of it. And also the ATM standard itself is quite fast. Private WAN infrastructure is very common now, especially in Australia and the rest of the world. We've got lots of providers like Optus have what they call the Evolve network. Vern have a product, Telstra have a product. It's basically MPLS over their internal network, but they present it to the customers just as ethernet. So they literally sell you a service and you just, it's just like a switch, a two port switch where one of those ports is in one building and the other port is in a different building. 
and you can do anything you like over it. It's completely private and isolated and it's very very fast. Of course you pay for what you what the speed that you want. Um, very prevalent now and frame relay and ATM no, no new frame relay or ATM services are being deployed. Pretty much everyone's going towards the Metro Ethernet style of technologies. Unfortunately, MPLS we don't spend a lot of time on. You just need to know that it exists. Uh, we spend a lot more time at the CCNP level, but you just need to understand that it exists. The easiest way to analogize it is that it's almost identical to trunking with VLANs, attitude at 1Q, where you've got inside the MPLS cloud lots and lots of packets, sorry, lots and lots of frames whizzing around that have labels on them to separate them from other people's traffic. So where VLANs, sorry, trunking would create a VLAN tag, MPLS creates a label and that's how we know whose traffic is destined for whose customer. And satellite technology. Some plates are very remote, can't even get ISDN out there. Satellite technology is the very is the only solution we can use for them. Like the middle of Australia or way outback farming lands where there's no no cable infrastructure we can get out there. So the only thing we can really use to get data out there is satellite. DSL as a broadband technology is very common and quite cost effective. Lots of different providers running DSL. It's got a few limitations though, one of which being distance. So the recommended standard is no more than five kilometers between your modem and the DSLAM inside the exchange because it's using the classic telephone lines, those old copper wires. And the closer you are to the exchange, the better your speed, the faster your speed. But due to attenuation over distance, the further you are away, the slower your internet connection is going to be. And there we have cable, cable modems. Similar technology to DSL, except instead of using the phone lines, it uses coaxial cable hanging up in the street. Doesn't have the same distance limitations because the way the cable network is set up, there are all the cable segments are a fixed length. So they run fiber optic, great distances to a, a power pole, and then they run cable in every direction for a fixed amount of length. So it doesn't matter if you're close to the cable modem termination or farther away, you're all, they've, they're engineered so the distance isn't a problem. You just get the speed, what you're prepared to pay for. Wireless technologies, municipal Wi-Fi, WiMAX, satellite internet, typically used when they're the only solutions you have. We don't really have a lot of this sort of technology here in Australia. It's quite prevalent in Asia and Europe where the population is quite close together so the wireless technology works quite well. But here in Australia, particularly Victoria, we're very spread out. So, I mean, we, there are fixed wireless that NBN are trying to roll out but it's not a successful technology because it's designed for a a large population in a small area, but it definitely exists in America, Asia and Europe. And 3G, 4G and now soon 5G is coming on the horizon. Uh, it's pretty fast. I'm, I personally have got a 4G, a proper 4G router to work upwards of 80 meg and that was pretty impressive so now 5G is coming along but of course it's a shared technology so I don't know if you've ever been to a large sporting event or or a concert or something like that and everything's fine until there's a break and everyone tries to use their phone and it just dies because it's just too many people in a small area and there's not enough coverage so it's a fantastic technology but it can be oversubscribed purely by the number of physical devices using a particular mobile phone cell.
Using VPNs over the public internet is by far the most cost-effective way of connecting your remote sites. So you can have a site-to-site -site link between your corporate head office and two remote sites or remote access with software or either a VPN client on your small office home office router. The reason why it's the most cost-effective is because you just have to get any old generic internet connection and you as the network administrator set up the VPN tunnels. If you were to use Frame Relay or ATM or Metro Ethernet least line services, the reason they're so expensive is because you have to rely on the ISP to do all the back-end configuration. Whereas this way, it doesn't matter who's, which ISP you use with a VPN, you just pay the basic price for a cheap internet connection through anybody and you have the VPN endpoints that you own. Very easy to move, very scalable. So, different types of WAN standards. What are we looking at? What are we thinking about? How far away is it? How much is it going to cost? Are we going to set up a private, hard, dedicated LAN like ATM, Frame Relay, or Metro Ethernet? Or are we just going to use the public internet and set up a VPN concentrator in the head end and have small VPN devices at the remote sites? cost-benefit relationship about what sort of WAN is best going to suit your needs. Alright, so WAN standards operate at layer 1 and 2. Definitely always layer 1 and layer 2. You can have permanent hard connections, you can have public WAN connections like cable, DSL, wireless or 4G or now 5G networks. We can have private connections such as ISDN or ATM, Metro Ethernet, MPLS. But private LANs, sorry, private WANs, you don't need any security because they're completely private. Your ISP guarantees your privacy. But if you're using the public internet, you need your VPN. You need your VPN concentrators to give you that security over the public internet. All right, thanks everybody, and we'll see you in the next one.